can collective licensing work? I, I, I think collective licensing definitely works. What it does, it provides an access to all music, uh, and people can use uh, copyrighted music anytime, anywhere, any place, on any device. Uh, creators get paid. Uh, there's an indemnity to the users of music, uh, so they don't get sued for copyright infringement if they do have licenses. Blanket licenses, obviously, was the most preferable because it covers everything. So definitely in every country of the world, uh, on all different levels, and globally, I think collection societies are absolutely essential. Some of the infrastructures uh, may have to be changed. The fees possibly have to come down. Operating costs are very important. But in the main, uh, it's really remember who you're working for. It's the creators, music publishers, writers, songwriters, and, and composers. So a collective license <laughs> ap applied to the internet can work if there is good uh, metadata and good transparency. Yeah, and al also reciprocal agreements, some kind of uh, international uh, stuff. Yeah, international reciprocal agreements between all the countries and all the parties in whatever form it takes because uh, there's so much of your, you know, it's global, so your performance, your, if you're an American writer or a German writer, your work's going to be performed throughout the entire world very easily, so there's got to be some kind of uh, reciprocal collection society mechanism that brings money back and forth between societies. If I can just say, I think that the, a very real issue is that we need to try and define the parameters within which negotiations should occur. In other words, we should be starting to look towards saying, for instance, how much of your traffic, Mr. ISP, is music? And therefore, if it's 10% of the, of the traffic is music, that gives you a basic point for saying, well, then that's 10% of your business. And I want a share of that, I want a, a share of 10% of your net revenues and this sort of thing. I think that penny rates are absolutely dead. It may be when you start talking about a model which includes downloads where people are paying for services, you might have penny rates. In other words, I don't think one, one, one solution fits all. I think there are layers and layers and layers of, uh, uh, of solutions. How does the ISP feel about, about what uh, Mr. Well, Jones I would, just said? I, would dig I was just gonna, I was agreeing with Peter that uh, on rates, I mean, it's a volume business, pure and simple. Um, in, in 02, there was a year when uh, the government forced mobile operators to slash their, their, uh, uh, the percentage of their profits by huge amounts. And they, everybody, they all thought their business was over because they were making like tenths and tenths of a P on a phone call instead of a lot. And the net result was that the company I was at made an extra one and a half billion that year because everybody just took their eye off the meter all of a sudden and started using a phone and just talking. And it's the same with music. The minute you start not really having to pay for it, you use a ton of it because people just throw it away or they'll get more and, and they stop thinking. And I think, so the licensing will work. Um, the real issues are around things like, I mean, there are a lot of people who don't, just don't consume music other than maybe listening to a radio. Should they pay? Um, these are the issues that need to be worked through. But uh, collective licensing, yes, and I think it actually is at the access point that you need to be uh, looking at it because it seems like it's the, it's the most fundamental kind of uh, place where you can track and see what things are happening. Yeah, I think collective licensing will work. Um, there are challenges, as we talked about, the metadata challenges, the allocation of ebooks versus music versus sound recording versus photograph versus video is going to have to be worked out as well, um, and the matching challenges to make sure everyone gets paid properly. But I do think what's important is that there has to be competition among and between collection societies so that the rights holder, the individual songwriter, the recording artist, the author gets to select who they want representing them. So without competition, you're not going to have lower administration fees, moves for to efficiency, the incentive to use the best technology to make sure that the matching occurs, uh, et cetera. So I think uh, with the combination of those challenges, which are very, very steep challenges, as long as there's money to pay for it, uh, I think those challenges can be overcome. If there's no money, no pool of money, there's no technology, and there's no in uh, creative uh, endeavors in any of these industries, and we're all in trouble. I'd like to ask uh, David Baskin to give us a brief overview of the law in Canada. Hi. Um, glad to be back here again with, uh, with the IAEL, and I wish I had more hopeful news to report about, uh, about the situation in Canada. Like everywhere else, sales are down, at least in the physical world. Um, unlike a lot of places, the, the few companies that are there doing business in the online world 
are doing lots of it. The sales are increasing uh, gratifyingly, and so is piracy. Um, the situation in Canada is, is made uh, ever more difficult by the uh, near impossibility of getting our government to pay attention to copyright. Um, until Parliament was suspended uh, before the end of uh, last year by uh, the Prime Minister, or as many regard him now, our dictator, uh, our, our, our Prime Minister basically, uh, to use the, the, the technical term, prorogued Parliament, which means he basically suspended Parliament until March, if, if it comes back. Um, I think it will, uh, but of course no legislation is proceeding and sadly the only place you can get legislation is from your government. Uh, Peter Jenner said that the, the last mile is local, that's very true, and although the internet itself is international, the existence of the internet that we encounter is at the local level, it is regulated locally and it is owned locally. I've had many discussions with people on the, the telco, the ISP side, and they, are, they have one thing in common. They are as opposed to the idea of liability for the use of music as they could possibly be, to the point of being in a screaming, spitting rage about it most of the time. Now, I can't speak for every country, but I suspect that it's much like Canada. Telephone companies, internet service providers, and companies on that scale are very substantial. They are very powerful politically. They donate to political parties. They have a constant presence as lobbyists in national capitals. They're big boys and girls. They despise the idea of liability. And in Canada, strangely enough, they enjoy a safe harbor, at least for the performing and communication right. One section of our Copyright Act says that to the extent um, a, a company like an ISP is operating as a mere conduit, as a vehicle over which the, the, the content is transferred, uh, it enjoys full liability and no responsibility for the communication right. It got that provision because it's powerful enough to have lobbied for it. Now, that doesn't apply to any other right. It does not apply to the right of reproduction. Conceivably, there may be some liability, but it's only a stroke of the legislative pen to provide them with another safe harbor as well. Obviously, should that issue arise, we would fight it with everything we have. The question would be, do we have enough to go up against the internet service providers? It's, it's, it's hard to, to convey just how ferocious they are on this. The usual explanation is, it's not our problem. Go solve your own problems. We didn't cause your problem, which of course is just silly. And not only that, we have a safe harbor, so. Exactly, you know, the, the analogy I've always drawn to ISPs, ISPs are like somebody standing outside a burning lumber yard selling rags and gasoline. <laughs> and when they're asked about the fire, they say, I, I don't know much about fires, I just sell rags and gasoline here. Um, <laughs> They are the fonts at Orego. They are the, the, they are the point from which the problem emerges. Eventually, if there is to be any, any solution, I'm afraid it will only come at the hands of a government which is determined enough to fix the problem. Can you just give us a current frame of reference for what you think is the, whether you feel that collective licensing is a vehicle that is working for the various people that you're representing and the monies that you're collecting and whether you're saying that there is some some light coming out of these dark clouds we've been having for the last 10 years. Well, I, I think collective licensing is effective for certain types of revenue streams. And clearly, we've kind of been at the forefront on the digital side of this, uh, both with our satellite radio and internet radio licenses in the United States. And we've certainly been the, um, I guess, beneficiary of some of that. And also, we've witnessed the, the downside of, uh, of an industry without a database of an industry with awful metadata, uh, inconsistent data, and data in need of normalization. And John, uh, how bad is that? Um, well, I would tell you that among my top 25, let me just put on glasses here, the top 25 people that I can't pay currently are Playlist Unavailable, uh, a, a group called Various Artists, you might have heard of them. Um, <laughs> if you actually start that band, there's a big check waiting for you. <laughs> Um, I, I played in that band for a there's while. There's also another group called Unidentified Artists. Um, we've got a lot of money for Beethoven and Mozart. And uh, Laugh Break 105, um, which actually is a station break that we got paid for. Um, quite a bit of money, actually. So we have those kinds of issues. And these come from the largest, best licensees, frankly. The ones who actually 90% of what they send us is usable that we can actually pay out on. Um, there's a, a very significant number of licensees who give us nothing. And, um, but these are generally not the 
the uh, legitimate recognized no these are very big legitimate services that re that say they cannot report to us and then we have to go after them and try to work with them and it takes what kind of services would they be isps would they be no these would be major broadcasters who are simulcasting online and then internet only webcasters um who are still trying to figure out how to get their technology and i've always thought well it's all computerized so this should be easy to do you push a button in certain programs and it spits out a report apparently not that easy. It seems extremely difficult to have 24, 25 societies in Europe having computers that are able to talk to each other. This is my layman lingo. It's, it seems extremely difficult, yet to me it would seem so easy to, to, to get it done. But for one reason or another it is, it is an unsurmountable hurdle still and we have fast track and in the beginning there was another project which was called IMJV and all those concepts are geared to one thing to make sure that we get these computers talk to each other because we know that for 60 percent of the repertoire they're doing the same thing already so it seems to me that it, it, it is something that needs to be uh, that needs to be cleared and, and can be cleared now unfortunately once we have taken that hurdle I think there are still another few hurdles that uh, that that remain on the on the licensing side Turning to the discussion of, of this morning about whether to grant a license to ISPs, and, and we take the position that the ISPs will always say that they have no liability, that they aren't concerned, that they don't want to get involved at all, unless you pay them, I think. And well, they can say that. They, they have a safe harbor. Well, for the, for the time being, they, well. they, have, they have a legal argument, which is relatively powerful. I gr I'll grant you that. But I think economics can overcome the law sometimes. So Thank it you. seems to me that we should be looking at a, at a licensing system whereby you grant the license, the societies grant the license to the consumers via the ISPs, and then we will buy their cooperation and the money that it, that it brings. Well, Otherwise, very it's not going to go. Collective licensing seems to be... Um, appearing more and more frequently now. Um, I think it's not the preferred solution for the music industry, um, but I think that's where it's going because the market is so dysfunctional at the moment. Um, and there's a number of different points here that sort of needs to be covered relatively quickly. Um, with ISPs, I'm a firm believer that you need to have a commercial incentive for ISPs to be helping us protect our content. And the only way that they're going to do that is if they're part of the value chain. They need to be involved. They, they need to just add value onto the transfer of music which is happening online. Just slapping a rate on that transfer of music and legitimizing P2P or, or, or BitTorrent or whatever it is doesn't create any more value for anyone. So we need ISPs to be building value on top of that transfer of music, be part of the value chain, effectively become a retailer then they've got a real incentive to help protect our content from being shared without any revenues coming back to us. So, so that's how I'd like to see approach that. Now, if collective licensing is going to be the way forward to handle that ISPs, then there needs to be a fair and tra transparent mechanism to ensure that that money goes back to the correct rights you, what holder. You're saying is the only real solution to this is a global rights database. Ideally, it needs to be a one-stop rights database. Publishing, authors, composers, uh, master rights holders, performers, all in one database. It needs to be controlled by a not-for-profit. It needs to be transparent. It needs to have easy and fair access to anyone who needs to interrogate that database to pull the information back. Matthew, uh, in China, you suffer from a situation where there's almost 100% piracy, save for the mobile companies. And even in China, China Mobile, 520 million subscribers take 80% of every single music offering that's given to uh, uh, their subscribers. Um, this whole notion of a safe harbor that uh, the ISPs have kind of been uh, huddling themselves around. Uh, obviously, China is uh, not the rest of the world, a different closed system, but what is your view on that? Okay, um, I think the safe harbor actually um, means that the ISPs, everyone in the food chain is uh, protected. Legally, they are not obliged to share any of the revenue with anyone. So maybe the business model has to be really looked at as what Simon said. Give them an incentive to try and build value on top of it. 
trying to beat up the ISPs might not be the best way to go about it. Uh, then we get into device manufacturers, we get into the router business, we get into computers, we get into portable devices. They're all guilty of uh, uh, facilitating piracy. In, and there's value added to the iPod, for example, because it is a repository in most of the world in Asia, the iPod is sold. It is a repository for uh, pirate, uh, pirated music. So where do we draw the line?